everyone. I'm Linda Dickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Over 100 sessions and a full calendar for the rest of the year. We are ready. We've got so much planned for you guys. My goal has been the same, to help us all connect, inspire, and create. And with the help of a guest that shares their passion for photography, they offer a little bit of inspiration to nudge you to try something new and their tips to help us all improve our photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on YouTube. Tonight's guest is Susan Hansen. Susan is a retired teacher and newspaper journalist and a nature and wildlife photographer based in Central Texas. In tonight's presentation, Exploring the Underwater World, Susan takes us along on her, exp on her explorations of her underwater playground, the San Marcos River. If you're on Instagram, please take a look at her page at Texas underscore bat underscore lady that's texas bat lady with underscores in between each of those words and on her website at susan k hansen.com so welcome to the happiness hour susan thank you and this is kind of weird because it's not weird it's you know when i say welcome to the happiness well when i say welcome to the happiness hour you're here just about every week i you haven't yeah. missed very many and um you know for the for people that are new to this program, I pull in photographers that have, you know, these huge accomplishments and they've been published and, and they have Pulitzers and a bunch of them have Emmys. But I also look for people like Susan, who, you know, she just posts little photos on Instagram and I think, okay, they're beautiful and they're fun and they're so interesting because they're things that I don't do, I don't, I'm not a swimmer. And um, she has been, I think you are probably in the water quite a few days of the year, even when it's cold. And mm -hmm. you, you get in there and play. And I started, um, I think we found each other. I know we found each other through Instagram. Mm -hmm. And at one point um, you sent me an invitation to a presentation um, that you were doing for, I think your local rotary club. Yes. And uh, for whatever reason, I was available that day and I clicked on it and I'm sitting here going, wait a minute, she's not just taking photos of the stuff in her backyard. She kind of gives a crap about the stuff in her backyard. <laughs> And I found it really, really compelling. And um, as I was filling this year's calendar, I, I had you in my mind of, I'm gonna just ask her to come and do this. And so when you said yes, I was like, yeah. So with that, I, you know, I kind of skimmed over your bio. Is there something that I missed that you wanna share with everybody? Not really. Um, anything else might come out when I'm talking. Okay. All right. Well, with that, if you're ready to do your presentation, I'll let you have yeah. the, the the camera. Okay. The floor. <laughs> yeah, is it the floor? I'm not real sure what it is. Right. Right. Thank you for asking me. I, I feel really honored. I've done presentations for other groups, and this is probably the, the coolest I've felt about doing one because it's friends. Okay. So I call this river time. That's what I call my Facebook posts that are that have something to do with the river. So without further ado, oops, okay. Um, about 14 years ago, I lost a job I really cared about. And I don't know if it was a midlife crisis or what, but I decided I need to get in the water. So first thing I did was buy a canoe. And when I was down at the river a lot, I would see little kids swimming, uh, you know, doing snorkeling and stuff like that. So I thought I could do that too. Interesting thing is I don't swim well, I don't like to swim and I don't like having stuff in my hair. And all of those three things, you know, you don't swim in the river if those are three things that bother you. But that's what I ended up doing. Um, just to give you a little background, I go once a week, usually Monday or Tuesday, 
uh, year round, got a wetsuit. Uh, this was a cold day one year. Um, and sometimes I go more than once a week, but once a week for sure, it's become a discipline for me as much as anything else. When I was thinking about where to go, this was a quote that came to me. Um, John Burroughs, a contemporary of John Muir, once wrote that to learn something new, take the path you took yesterday. So basically I swim the same route every week. Um, and the, the challenge is, can I find something new? Can I see something familiar and shoot it in a little different way? And so that's been my challenge for the last 10 years, probably. This is what it looks like. Um, I start at City Park, go up river to the falls. It's about two thirds of a mile round trip. It's not that far, but you have to remember the water is really fast. And so you're working against the current all the way up. Coming back is a little more fun, but all the way up, it's, it's a lot of work. What I shoot with is, um, um, it's a hobbyist camera, but it's ranked really well for a hobbyist camera. It's an Olympus TG6 with a fisheye lens. And cool thing about this camera is the lenses can be screwed on and off underwater. And so you can take it off if you want to. I just tend to leave it on because it gives me more light and more image. Um, there's a little bit about the camera. You can shoot raw with it, which is a really nice thing. Um, it has some, some underwater white balance, that sort of stuff. It, it can do macro, microscope, wide, HDR, so on. Has a built-in flash, which I almost never use because a flash underwater looking at your subject with the flash right there uh, tends to mess up your picture. Okay, oops. Okay, speaking of how I do my pictures, um, I like to use Adobe Bridge. Oops, let me go back one. Um, I know a lot of people use Lightroom, but I, I just got used to Adobe Bridge, which does similar things. Uh, it, it gives you a catalog of your photographs and you can look at them and decide what you want to cut and what you want to keep and, and go from there to um, camera raw. And that's an example of uh, a photograph right from the camera. Uh, oops, excuse me. They tend not to be that great right out of the camera. Um, one thing about the Olympus TG6 and uh, taking underwater pictures with it, at least my experience, is you have to work on the pictures afterwards. It seldom gives me something that I can just say, oh yeah, there it is. I, I do all the stuff afterwards. I, I crop, I go through with the white balance and the shadows and the this and the that. So I do a lot of computer work, which is not ideal, but that's my life. So there you go. So um, here's examples before and after. This is a, a Rio Grande Cichlid, by the way. And not a lot of work was done on that, but cha just changing the tone or, or just, just a few changes and you get a much better picture. That's another example. That's a, a sunfish. And this is just light coming into the water. Uh, when I got, you know, I was seeing something that was pretty spectacular. When I looked at it in the camera, I went, oh, shoot, I didn't get anything. And then when I played with it a little bit with, um, you know, the camera raw settings and so on, it showed me a little bit more like what I was seeing. There are a lot of challenges with what I do, um, taking photographs in the, in the river. Um, oddly enough, sunny days are not my friend. You get a lot of light and shadow, just like you would in, you know, above, above the water. Um, and so, Cloudy days are much better actually for color and for lack of shadows, particulates in the water. Uh, the San Marcos River is exceptionally clear. Uh, you could drink it, it's perfectly safe. It's, it's really good water, at least up near the headwaters where I swim. Uh, but if anybody walks in the water uh, upstream of you or is doing some kind of work in the, in the river, what have you, uh, particulates in cloudy water really can screw up the pictures. Uh, you have to remember most of the subjects of my film, my camera uh, photos uh, are moving. 
and am I. Okay, we're, we're both moving. The current's very swift. And I put this picture in here. It's not a good picture, but it shows me holding my trash bag because I'm multitasking. I've got my camera in my right hand and my trash bag under my left arm. And that's kind of how I roll. And so you, know, you have to deal with a lot of things at once. Okay, this next section is just gonna show you the things that I photograph. Um, I don't have a background in biology, um, but I'm fascinating. Uh, I'm fascinated by, by wildlife and nature and so on. And so I've done a lot of reading, but most of what I've learned about these things really has come from either people I know, I've made a lot of friends in, in the river, literally, and uh, websites. There are not a lot of good books out there that, that have been helpful to me. So here are the fish. Uh, most obvious ones are the sunfish. They're everywhere. They're very small fish uh, for the most part, uh, sometimes very colorful and very curious fish. They just swarm all around me. Um, here's an example uh, of a picture that really didn't work right. And we had a speaker a few weeks ago who talked about photography as art and photography as documentation. This is an example, I think, of what you can do with a bad picture. You can, I don't know, turn it into art as opposed to just throwing it away. And so that's what I've done with a lot of my photographs. It didn't quite have the clarity I liked. And excuse my clock, I live in a house of clocks. Uh, these are red breast sunfish. They're very plentiful. Oddly enough, they're not native. I didn't know that, but there are a lot of them. And um, I think they're quite beautiful, especially during mating season. Some more, uh, you, you see why they're called sunfish because they're so iridescent. Like I said, they're very curious. They come up to me and just stare at me, uh, which is kind of fun, like that. <laughs> that was the other day, like two days ago. Um, and there's no background because there are places in the river where there is no vegetation, it's just open. And that's kind of kind of weird, actually. Some more. This is actually a bluegill, which is a kind of sunfish. You can tell by the black dot on the dorsal fin. Uh, kind of grumpy looking, real grumpy looking. The red-eared sunfish is fascinating to me. It's the largest of the sunfish, very sturdy fish. They're, they're actually pretty big. And during mating season, the males will guard the nest. And the nest is basically a scooped out bowl in the sand, or, or usually it's kind of silt or sand. Uh, and you'll find several nests together in kind of a community. And this is what the eggs look like. That's sunfish eggs. And what's so fascinating about this, these sunfish is I will go up to take a picture hold my hand out with the camera in it and the fish will charge me and bump my hand. Uh, they're, they're really assertive fish. Um, the largemouth bass, that's the apex predator in the river. Um, they're much larger. These are the ones the fishermen go after. Um, they too are pretty curious and very assertive and they'll come to stare at me as well. Get pretty close like that or that, that's one with some sunfish. So you can get an idea of how much larger they are. The Rio Grande cichlids, I think are among the most beautiful fish that we have. They're actually quite small. Um, I caught one once barehanded, which was kind of a surprise to both of us, the fish and me, but about the size of my hand is, is the size of one. They have interesting faces uh, like that. They're very delicate looking, the fins are, I think. And they tend to move around in pretty large schools. So if you find one, you're gonna find several as a rule. That's what they look like in breeding season. Um, the white uh, on the front of the fish. And that's their eggs. 
Um, unlike the sunfish, they don't make a nest. They just lay their eggs on a rock and call it a nest. And um, instead of charging you when you come up to get, you know, get close to the nest, they just kind of go in a circle swimming around the nest as if that's going to scare you away. And it doesn't, but that's the way it goes. I actually saw some uh, fingerlings hatching from, from these once, and it was very surreal. Uh, this is the gray red horse. It's a very unusual fish. Um, swims mm, near the bottom usually. Um, and that's a shot of a number of them. I don't usually see that many together, but that day I did. This is probably my favorite. Uh, the spotted gar is, is just a beautiful fish and it's always a surprise to see one. Um, I was hiding behind some vegetation when I took this picture. It just happened to show up. I saw the tail and the tail's a giveaway. So I got really excited when it showed up. It's another shot of the spotted gar, not to be confused with the alligator gar, which is mean. This is a very docile fish. And that's in Spring Lake, which is the headwaters of the river. I was looking at it from above Whereas the San Marcos River where I swim is very shallow. Uh, you can stand up in most places. This is the lake and it's, that's probably 20 feet deep at this, at this point. This is one of the most unusual fishes, the, the Guadalupe darter. Um, it's a couple of inches long, that's all. These are, some of these fish are very tiny. Uh, it has no swim bladder, so it can't swim. And so it just kind of scoots along the bottom of the river um, called a darter because it literally just darts along. And so they're kind of hard to photograph because they're very, very fast. And this is in very fast water. They like to live in fast currents, rocky bottoms. And so uh, that kind of raises an issue. If, if you know the habits of some of these creatures, you can find them a lot more easily. Like I know where the uh, red or sunfish nest. And so I can go look for them certain times of the year. I know where these guys like to swim. And so I can look for them as well. There's another shot of the Guadalupe darter. It's a relative of the endangered fountain darter, which is also a, a resident of our river. And then something you can't miss are the Mexican tetras, which are not native, but they apparently don't do any damage to the river. Um, they were probably released as bait many years ago, uh, and they've really done a splendid job of populating the river and they swim in large schools and they're very strange in that they just circle you as you're swimming along down the river. They'll be right in front of you and just kind of circle around you. They're very fast and also hard to photograph. That's what they look like a little closer up. Shiners are even smaller. Uh, a little bit, they're thinner, and um, they're even harder for me to photograph, but you can see why they're called shiners. There's another shot of a group of them. These are, are among my favorite fish. I won't say they're my favorite because the gar is, but these are really cool fish and very weird fish. Uh, they're called mosquito fish uh, because they like to eat mosquito larvae. And um, they're very oddly shaped. They swim up near the surface of the water and you can see them there reflected in the surface of the water. Um, and that's how big they are. They're little bitty guys. Um, like I said, oddly shaped and um, almost translucent. They're so, so unusual. And they will come and nibble on your hand or your toes or whatever. So, okay, there are a couple of invasive fish that we also have. The Placostomus is um, also called the sucker mouth catfish, and it was dumped out of aquariums. This is something you'll find in the bottom of an aquarium. It's a bottom cleaner. Um, and they get quite large. 
if they're not in an aquarium. And this is one hung on to the side of the, um, there's, there's a wall in the river in one of the parks that you go through. And that's what it's on. They're kind of creepy fish, I think. And the other one that's invasive is the tilapia. Uh, both of these fish are um, hunted in the San Marcos River. We have a, a young man who is hired by the city to go out and spearfish them. And uh, yeah, and twice a year they have a spearfishing tournament and collect all the fish. He freezes it uh, till after the second tournament and then makes fish tacos for whoever wants to show up, which is pretty cool. So they don't go to waste. Uh, I ran into one of these spear fishermen a few weeks ago and it kind of startled me and I asked him please not to shoot me and he said he wouldn't, so that was good. Uh, turtles, I, I just love photographing or even just seeing turtles. I consider any swim a success if I see a turtle. And we have five different kinds of turtles. I'm gonna show you four of the five. Uh, these are probably the most common, the river cooters. This one obviously just kind of came up to me and looked at me, which was kind of strange. They don't usually do that, but that was kind of cool. You have to pay attention. Uh, I was just swimming along one day and happened to look over to my left and there was a turtle, you know, just right there at the surface of the water. Uh, sometimes things like that can, can just kind of sneak up on you. As they get older, you know, they develop the, the mossy back like that. And so they're hard to spot in that case. You might be thinking, well, isn't that cute? A mama and a baby, but that's not what it is. That's a female, very large female and a very small male. That's the way it goes. The males are quite small comparatively, uh, have longer tails, so you can distinguish between the two pretty easily. He was obviously, you know, interested in her. She didn't look too thrilled. That's another photo of a male and a female. And you can see the male on the right, the tail is quite long. And that's a baby I happened to cross uh, earlier this spring. They're just amazingly beautiful, I think. Snappy turtles. This is a guy I ran into one day in about 10 feet of water. It happened to be a, a deep spot in the river at the time. And there were a bunch of cans down there. And I was diving down, picking up cans, you know. And when I got up to the top, I was went off to the side for a minute to put some cans down. I turned around and looked down into the water and that's what I saw. And I went, oh my God, I was right there by this guy. He's quite old, uh, pretty gnarly looking actually, like that. Um, but I figured he was about six Coke cans long. So he was a pretty good sized guy. Now this guy, <laughs> um, I knew that there was an old snapping turtle living mm. under, that's my dog, under a dock in uh, one of the parks along the river, but I'd never seen him. Other Friends had seen him, but I never had. And so one day I was, I was swimming through some pretty thick vegetation here. And um, I was looking for tilapia and a red-eared slider that I'd seen. And I wasn't paying attention. And I looked up and here he was coming at me at a clip, pretty fast clip. And I backed up as quickly as I could, took a few pictures and I was out of there. And I've looked for him ever since and haven't found him again. I'd like to. Uh, speaking of red-eared sliders, here's one. That's what they look like. And then musk turtles. If you saw one of these in the water, you'd probably say, oh, a baby, isn't that cute? But that's as big as they get. They're, they're very small, probably again, the size of my hand at most, probably smaller. They're very feisty little guys though. Uh, they're very small, but they can look at you like they're going to eat you. And they're very fast. Sometimes you'll see them out in the open like this, but they'll take off really fast. This is a baby musk turtle that some friends of mine found. They were working in the river, pulling out um, invasive species, plants, and 
when they do that, they have to go through the plants very carefully to make sure they're not throwing away a creature of some kind. And sure enough, in this vegetation was this little guy, a baby musk turtle, which I thought was very cute. The only turtle, turtle I did not show you is the uh, soft shell turtle, which we have, but which I don't have a good underwater picture of one. Um, the swamp crayfish or crawdad is something you, you run into every now and then. Again, usually on a cloudy day. Okay, plants. Um, San Marcos River has a lot of different plants in it. Um, and they have been the, the hardest thing for me to learn. I became friends with some plant biologists though, and they've been a big help to me. The most uh, obvious plant is Texas wild rice, which is an endangered species and which is one of the reasons we still have a river. Um, had this not been protected, uh, we people could have drained, uh, taken water from the river and basically harmed it uh, in, in, a, in a big way. The rice is mostly underwater and it is in the current. It needs that, that condition, um, the temperature and the, the flow. It needs a constant flow. And so you see this very undulating uh, riverscape, I guess you could say. It does that and you get some color with it as well. Um, it creates little tunnels almost and it's really interesting to swim through. Um, a lot of people call it weeds. They, the students who swim in the river, for example, get kind of put out with it sometimes because it's very easy to get caught up in it. Um, people have actually drowned when they've panicked when they've gotten caught up in it. Um, what I always tell people though, is if, if, you, if that happens to you and, and you're kind of freaking out, just try to stand up because the river in most cases, as I said, is pretty shallow and you can do that. This is another plant that's very common and the turtles seem to really like to, to hang out in this pond weed, which can, look pretty spectacular when the light hits it a certain way. Ludwigia, which is a red plant. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much color there is in the river, but this is a very beautiful plant when it's really red like this. This is a plant that has just gone crazy. Uh, during the pandemic, the, the parks were closed for a, great, a good long while. And so the river was not used much. I was in there by myself a lot. And so a lot of the plants had an opportunity to really flourish. And this is one that's, that's done that. Pennywort, that's what it looks like. Kabamba is a very odd plant um, in that it blooms underwater, which is pretty cool. Sagittaria, it's kind of a neat looking plant, stargrass. These are things that I had to ask people about. What the heck is this? You know, wild rice is easy. Um, pondweed is easy. But some of these other things I don't see as often. They're not as plentiful. And so I really had to find out what the heck is this? Algae. Hygrophila is actually an invasive plant. It's pretty prevalent in the river as well. Looks a lot like Ludwigia. But as my biologist friends taught me, the underside of a hygrophila leaf is green, whereas it's red with Ludwigia. Coontail is a plant that grows in the lake. Uh, it grows so very fast that it has to be mowed, basically. And so unfortunately, it is mowed and then left to just go downstream. And it does this. It clogs up. Uh, the river like that. I'm moving now from things that I photograph like fish and plants to color because that's one of the, the most um, fun things, I guess, about being in the river and trying to see what colors there are. 
obviously lots of green, colorful plants though. Susan, can I interrupt you with a question? Egidio uh, was curious, and I and I was curious too. So, are the plants that you're showing us are they common all year round, or do yes. they are they seasonal? Okay. Yeah, they're common all year round. Uh, in the winter, they're not as thick, which is one reason I like to to go swimming in the winter because you see more fish and turtles. Uh, in the you know summer and spring, they get thicker and but they're there year round. Because I mean, that, that's gorgeous. I mean, those plants are gorgeous. They really are. I mean, the wild rice comes above the water in places and that did freeze back last year, okay. um, but it was back green within weeks. So, and every now and then a flood will come along and scour the river. And I'm always surprised at how fast the plants come back. Well, since I've already interrupted you, let me ask this question oh, no problem. <laughs> for Jamie, because okay. um, I, I'm afraid the answer that you're going to give is going to definitely keep us both out of the water. But Jamie wants to know, she, and I'm with you, Jamie, we're snakeophobes. How often, no. if ever, do you run into water moccasins in the river? I never have. Really? Okay. I never have. Um, I see a water snake every now and then, very rarely, and usually if I'm out of the water. Um, I've been told by friends, oh, I saw a water moccasin down at such and such, but I've not ever seen one. Um, so, yeah. I'm still not getting in the water, but I had to ask. I know. Okay. Back to color. You never know what color you're going to get. <laughs> Probably the most fun I have is taking pictures that show some kind of reflections or that do something weird with light. Um, and so that's what this next section is. One thing, um, it, it took me a while to learn this, but just tilting your camera up, <laughs> you get pictures of the undersurface of the water. And that to me is the most fascinating thing. Um, so you get reflections like this. The water, as I said, is, is super clear. And so the reflections are, are clear as well. That's very shallow water. You can probably guess that. This was a picture I took a week or so ago. And I asked some friends, what is that on the surface there? It looks like oil, you know. Um, they're speculating it could be pollen, it could be uh, just some kind of plant matter, most likely. But it created an effect much like oil on water, which I thought was interesting. I tend to go in the morning, um, partly because I like the light. Um, just as it comes up above the trees, uh, it really penetrates the water in some interesting ways. And then there are over under photos, um, obviously where you're taking a picture that's partly under the water and partly above the water. They're a little hard to do in the river uh, because the water's moving. And um, so I'll just say that. <laughs> This is wild rice in um, City Park. And that is rice under the water there. That's looking up toward the dam, the headwaters. Very shallow water there. What I really enjoy doing is on a real dreary winter day, taking a picture that shows color underwater and gray above water. That was a day when there was actually steam on the river, which is wonderful. The river is constant uh, 72 degrees year round, uh, but on a cold day, you'll get this kind of effect. Then there's trash. I, I couldn't resist taking, showing you some pictures of trash. 
this is kind of weird. These are your golf balls, okay? Um, there was a golf course next to the headwaters of the river for many, many, many years. And so they're golf balls in the slough that runs into the river. And when the slough flooded in 2015, all these golf balls were washed down into the river. A lot of them are still in the lake. And I've gone out um, with crews to rescue balls or, or get balls out of the lake. And so far we have, I think, 22,000 golf balls. Um, that's just an estimate. Um, when, right after the flood, I collected a bunch of golf balls and ended up with 35 pounds of golf balls, which is hard to carry to your car. So I never did that again because that was stupid, but I got 20 bucks for them, so. I don't know, Jamie's saying you can get a dollar a ball. I'm kind of thinking, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're gonna need some yeah. information on that, Jamie. <laughs> That's me collecting golf balls in the lake. This is a very shallow part of the lake, but if you see one golf ball, you pick it up and you stick your hand down into the silt and you find about 20 more. So it's pretty fun. That's what, we, what I got that day, one day. I've also found some interesting trash. That's me hauling a traffic cone back to where I was gonna get out. And that's a selfie, by the way. So, but yeah, that's the trash I, I got out that day. I always take pictures of what I get because it's just a good record, I think. So, and that's not an unusual day. A lot of it's been buried for many, many years and it just washes up continually. Sometimes you'll find something that's not even made anymore, like some kind of beer you've never heard of, that kind of thing. And you get shoes and you get clothing. And the coolest thing I ever found was a pair of shorts that after we washed them here at home, I was gonna give them to Goodwill, but there's 80 bucks in the pocket. So there you go. <laughs> And I always go through the trash very carefully, partly to sort it, but partly to see if there are any creatures in the trash. And this day, I think there were three crawdads in the bag. So this one was in a glass insulator, which was kind of weird. The crawdads like clothing. So if I get a t-shirt or socks or something, you know, I always go through that really carefully. Okay, I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but this is one other place I like to go. Uh, Jacob's Well is in Wimberley. Um, Rose will probably know all about this. It's a county park now, so you have to have reservations to go. Um, you've probably read about Jacob's Well or heard about it. It's um, basically a cave system, okay? The well itself is, um, those are some people in the well, basically, the deep part of the, of the swimming hole. Um, it's 30 feet down, but then the cave itself goes mm, another 5,500 feet or so, and at its deepest, it's 140 feet down. About eight or nine scuba divers have died in there, so it's a very dangerous place to go scuba diving and you can't anymore. Only science divers can go in there into the cave itself. I have no desire to even think about that. That creeps me out. But anyway, these are photographs that I've taken there. I try to go a couple of times every summer, not to take pictures of plants or fish, although there are some there, uh, but to take pictures of what I see underwater, people. That's the well, looking down into it. Um, it's kind of odd because when you look down into it, you'll see the light reflected back. It's like there's a light down there. It's very odd. This is a guy diving, trying to go down. It's very hard to do that. <laughs> um, but, so what I take pictures of are people diving into the well. I think it's fascinating. And um, so lots of bubbles, lots of, weird poses um, and you'll see some fish here with this guy there's yeah, also 
Oh, let me let me interrupt real quick before sure. you go further, because Jamie yes. had a question and it's about okay. the well. She wanted to know, is there a current coming up from the well? Is it a spring? It's a spring. Yeah, um, it's not what it used to be. There used to be a, basically a fountain that would shoot up like 20 feet. Um, and I have known people who, when they were kids, said that's what it was like. Now there's not. Um, I can't tell that there's a current coming up. There's obviously water coming out. It feeds Cypress Creek in Wimberley. Um, and it has gone dry a couple of times. Um, but yeah, there's not a, a noticeable current to me, at least. Uh, the other question is, uh, video is asking, do you know if you have to pay an admission if you only want to photograph the area? No, no. If you want to, um no and and you can get into the park year round uh if you want to swim the swim season is from like may to september something like that and even then it's not expensive but that's just swimming it's free to, just to get in so i just hang out on the on the rim of the of the uh, well and see what I can get. Oops. That's a little farther down, um, downstream, obviously not in the well. Just pictures of people's feet, kind of, kind of odd, I guess. A little surreal. <laughs> um, this is one I actually got a prize for, um, which kind of blew me away. I was, um, I got an email announcing who the prize winners were, you know, and I'm just going down the list and, oh my God, I won the thing. How'd this happen? <laughs> it was pretty cool. There again, reflections and color is, is pretty, uh, pretty much a part of the photographs there. A little abstract. And that's it. That's a lot. Thank you for watching. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, if anybody has any questions, now's the time to stick them in the chat. There's a lot of thank yous. Uh, you know, what um, I think you already said it, but what I found really interesting was on those dreary gray days, mm -hmm. the color under the water was so vivid. Yeah, um, you wouldn't think that it would be the best day, best time to go, but it is. It was it was really, really interesting. Um, and another thing I found surprising is when you said you're not really a strong swimmer or what? No. But give, you know, give me a pair of fins and a snorkel and I'm fine. Uh, yeah, and I've taken uh, my wetsuit and snorkel and whatnot on trips with me. Uh, okay. I try to find places to go, clear water, you know, and I've done it in Norway, um, which was the most fun going into a part of a, a, an arm of the North Sea, you know, that was really cool. And British Columbia, we went up kayaking in the Discovery Islands, you know, and um, that was fun. Um, sometimes people don't understand though, when I say, is there a place around where you live to snorkel? what <laughs> what do you mean oh, no. you know, and i i'm kind of with that um, yeah. kind of thought because when i think of snorkeling i think going to the caribbean i'm going right. to be in a big ocean sea whatever um yeah. with clear you know very clean clear water that you could uh -huh. look for, you know fancy fish um right. but it it surprises me 
Uh, one, I would want, okay, first of all, everybody, I'm, I'm not a swimmer. I'm uh -huh. kind of, I don't like anything that I can't see the bottom of. Um, and, uh, anything that kind of swims by you and, and touches me, uh, uh -huh. game over. I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> in for it. So I'm fascinated by the story. And when I heard you give this presentation, it, it kind of, um, resonated with me of gosh, you know, we're just so used to what we do above the water and you forget uh -huh. about the, I mean, I, I love fish. I'm fascinated by colorful fish mm -hmm. and, but what kind of grabbed me in your presentation that first time and I'm glad that you shared it here were all the grasses uh -huh. and you know to me I just think oh it's reeds or weeds you know I don't I wouldn't have thought to maybe I should look up you know some of the names of these things right. and I, I think that uh I can't remember the name of it but the the one I stopped you on it had a lot of red in it and it just kind of reminded me of a house plant that's got that red, it's not an ivy, yeah. but it's got that red veining in it. And to see so much of it under the water, um, yeah. it was just beautiful. And and you showed me something I'm never going to see. And that's what makes your presentation interesting to me. So I, I think that there's quite a few comments in here that you're going to enjoy seeing. And I, I thank you so much for for doing the presentation. I, I was pretty much pretty certain that you would do it if I asked, but I, I get really excited when people say yeah, they will. So I should tell you when I started snorkeling, the first time I went to the park uh, where I swim, it, it's the, the university park, which feeds into the city park to connected. But I got in at the university park where all the beautiful girls and you know, in their bikinis and whatnot were. And there I was in my shorts and t-shirt because I didn't have my wetsuit at the time. And I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. And the water happened to be really high and fast that year. And so I basically just fell into the water. And in two minutes, I was down in City Park. It was that fast. But I was scared to death I was going to run into the elephant ears. And there were a lot of elephant ears in the water at the time. And that, to me, just you know, it must be teeming with snakes in my mind it was. And so what happened was I ran into the elephant ears and it's like, okay, I've done the scariest thing I imagined. Now let's get on with it. I'll do it again. So it was really cool. Uh, yes. Really, really enjoyed it. Well, kudos to you. And, and thank you for picking up the trash, you know, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of people get in the water and they're just in it for their own recreation. And I mean, you're doing that too, but you're making a, a, a concerted effort to take trash bags and pull out garbage and spend the time to look for critters and put them back where they belong. Yeah. So when you strip a little crawdad of his house, you've made him homeless. I did, but I put him back in the water. So, oh, but yeah, he has to find a pretty, another little opening, another bottle. I know. Susan, okay. thanks for doing this for us. Well, you guys, you can connect with her, Susan Hansen, through her website at susankhansen.com and on Instagram at Texas underscore bat underscore lady. So that's Texas bat lady. Um, next week, please join us when Texas nature and landscape photographer Rob Doyle takes us on a little West Texas road trip in his presentation, Capturing the Magic of West Texas. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful, and I hope that we see you again soon.